Well, good morning to each one of you. If you would, open to Jeremiah chapter 20. Jeremiah chapter 20, that's where I want us to pick up here in verse 7. Thankful for the presence of all, want to get right on into it. In Jeremiah 20 here and in verse 7. Jeremiah says, O Lord, you have deceived me, and I was deceived. You have overcome me and prevailed. I have become a laughing stock all day long. Everyone mocks me. For each time I speak, I cry aloud. I proclaim violence and destruction. Because for me, the word of the Lord has resulted in reproach and derision all day long. In verse 10, he says, For I have heard the whispering of many. Terror on every side. Denounce him. Yes, let us denounce him. All my trusted friends watching for my fall say, Perhaps he will be deceived so that we may prevail against him and take our revenge for him. As you notice here in this text, Jeremiah was chosen by God to speak a message to the people of Israel. He was, as he lays out in verse 7, a laughing stock. He was mocked. And it made sense for Israel because he had a terrible message. Everyone at this time, or at least the majority, were thinking that, well, okay, we're not going to go into captivity. And Jeremiah is the opposite. He is one of the few that is saying, actually, you are going to go into captivity. You are going to receive punishment that the Lord had been giving. He had a bad message for the leaders of Israel. But as you look here in verse 9, this is the one that we are the most familiar with in Jeremiah 20. He says, but if I say, I will not remember him or speak any more in his name, then in my heart he becomes like a burning fire. Shut up in my bones, and I am weary of holding it in, and I cannot endure it. Jeremiah would say things like, I will not remember him, or I will not speak any more in his name. It made sense, right? He'd been made fun of, he had a bad message, all of those type of things. It was really discouraging him. But you'll notice what he says. I can't forget God. I have to speak. And when he didn't, it was like a burning fire. Have you ever had those types of things? Maybe you've had a a fireplace that just keeps getting hotter and hotter and hotter. It starts pushing you out of the room, right? As you'll notice here, it was a burning fire within him that he could not hold in. This morning, as we talk about personal evangelism, you know, for many Christians, we fall into a situation similar to Jeremiah. We are beaten and we are downcast, we are made fun of, and we may think, man, I just keep telling all the bad news, it seems like. And while we may be like him in some ways, we have this burning fire, many times that fire may be going out, or that fire may be dying down. You know, maybe at one point we were zealous and we were passionate. Maybe whenever we were first baptized, we had received the grace and we were fired up about it. We wanted to share with people, we wanted to tell people. But now perhaps we are discouraged, or even worse, just apathetic. We don't even really care. You know, in fact, one of the crying shames that can happen is that we may not even think about sharing the gospel with anyone anymore. What happened? (laughs) You have a man that was on fire initially whenever we came up out of the water, but now things have changed. You know, there's a whole bunch of different reasons. We could go through and spend a whole week just going through and talking about how this process changes. But I think sometimes we lose our fire because we forget where we fit in God's system, where we fit in His plan for evangelism and fulfilling His mission. We maybe have misconceptions about how it works. We don't know how God works and how God operates or my part in it. And then... Whenever it doesn't go maybe according to our plan, well, the fire goes out. Well, today we're going to clear our focus to change our attitude and re-put a different perspective on the role that you and I play in evangelism and where we fit in God's great work. If you would turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, we're simply going to discuss three main points this morning, and they are providence, preparation, and prayer. Those are the three things we'll discuss this morning. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 is where our main text will be this morning. If you'll notice here, picking up in verse 5, as we begin talking about providence, in verse 5 he says, What then is Apollos, and what is Paul, servants through whom you believed, even as the Lord gave opportunity to each one? 
I planted, Apollos watered, but God was causing the growth. So then neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but God who causes the growth. Now he who plants and he who waters are one, but each one will receive his own reward according to his labor. For we are God's fellow workers, you are God's field, God's building." When we think about the idea of providence, what we're talking about is we're talking about how God is at work. Providence is God working through non-miraculous means to accomplish His will. That's what providence is all about. It's through the manner of, of normal, everyday conversations and interactions. God uses those through His miraculous power, His own, to perform His will. So it is in non-miraculous ways that He is going through and accomplishing that will. His will, though, is accomplished through speaking. Turn over to John chapter 6. In John chapter 6, as we consider the question, what is God's will? So God is working through his divine power in non-miraculous ways, and he is arranging events and people, and one of those initially was Jesus. And Jesus came here in John 6 and verse 38, and he talks about what God is interested in, what God's will is about. And in John 6 and verse 38, he says, For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. It's a good attitude. He says in verse 39, This is the will of him who sent me, that of all that he has given me I lose nothing, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father that everyone who beholds the Son and believes in Him will have eternal life, and I myself will raise Him up on the last day. If you wonder what the will of God is in your life, you know, we have a lot of religious people that say, what is God's will for my life? What is God's will for my life? John 6 lays it out. It is your salvation. That is the thing that God is concerned about. Paul talks about it in 1 Thessalonians 4. He says, the will of God is this. Your sanctification. He wants sin out of your life, and he wants you to be home with him for eternity. That is God's will for your life. Now, God's will is accomplished, though, through teaching. It's the only way that it's accomplished. It's not through some miraculous way. It's not some osmosis where you can put the Bible under your pillow and it's just going to miraculously seep into your mind. It's not how it works. It's a spoken message for every single person. You know, God could have chosen a lot of different means, couldn't he? Maybe he could have controlled our minds to where we have a a picture of Jesus and he goes through and, and gives us the information on what it takes to be saved or any number of means. But you'll notice what Paul said in 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 7. He said, we have this treasure in earthen vessels. Think of all the means that God could have used. And he decides to use people. People are his means. In writing and speaking, that's how he goes about and wants to bring people to him. Turn over to 2 Timothy chapter 2. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, you'll notice what Paul says here, and we'll go back over to John 6 here in just a minute. But in 2 Timothy 2 here in verse 2, Paul gives the charge to Timothy. And he says here in verse 2, The things which you have heard from me, okay, there's one person to another, in the presence of many witnesses, entrust these to faithful men. So Paul to Timothy to faithful men, and what are they to do? Who will be able to teach others also. That's how God uses people. He uses people to communicate and and carry a message to other people. Turn on to John 6. John 6 also gives us an example of this. In John 6 here in verses 44 and 45. What you'll notice is Paul uh, is that Jesus will reference the prophets. And that is another example of how God uses people. He uses people to speak forth his message. And here in verse 44, he says, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. He says, It is written in the prophets, They shall all be taught by God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. How were they taught by God? They were taught through people. People like the prophets who go and communicate the message that God has. So then as we think about God's desire to accomplish His will, it has to be done through teaching. 
Well, we also need to realize that God is interested in making opportunities for that to happen. Turn over to Matthew chapter 7. In Matthew chapter 7, I want to ask you the question, would God be true to his nature in the fact that he wants all men to be saved if he didn't give opportunity to people who are interested in the gospel? Just think about that. Would God be true to his nature if he didn't give opportunities to true seekers? We know in Matthew 5 and verse 6 that he says, He who hungers and thirsts after righteousness will what? Will be filled, right? That's not a may be filled or it's possible they'll get filled. It will be filled. Look at Matthew 7 again here in verse 7. He says, Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds. And to him who knocks, it will be opened. The Lord is interested in people that are interested in him. And he will make a way for that. We have to be trusting, though, that God is working behind the scenes. Let me give you an example of this. Turn over to John chapter 4. You know, sometimes it's interesting to go through and you can understand concepts, but it's a lot easier when you see the, the practical step of what, of what we're discussing. And John 4 is a good example of this. You'll notice in John 4, Jesus has been going through and working with the woman at the well, and he talks here with his disciples. And he says here in verse 36, he says, Already he who, receive, who reaps is receiving wages and is gathering fruit for life eternal, so that he who sows and he who reaps may rejoice together. For in this case the saying is true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap for reap that for which you have not labored. Others have labored, and you have entered into their labor. What is Jesus talking about here in this text? He's talking about how the, the disciples here, they're going to receive a harvest. But you'll notice what he's saying? is that God's already been working. God's been using other people that have been going and doing the sowing, and in this case, you're going to benefit from other people working. So what do we understand from John 4? Is that God is working in people's lives and circumstances, and he will put us in contact with those type of opportunities. You know, God promises that genuine seekers will find, but that process has to come about through teaching. Turn to Romans chapter 10. I think many times what happens when we think about the gospel and we think about sharing it, we think that it's just going to happen. Like it's just maybe someone walks in the door, which that's really good. But I think we just expect things to kind of fall into place and we expect God to work outside of his chosen means. But it's not how it is. God only works through the teaching process. And Romans 10 brings this up here in verse 14 talks about those who will call in the name of the Lord will be saved in verse 13. But look at the question he brings, these questions he brings up. He says, how then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? It's impossible. They can't call on him if they don't believe. How will they believe in him whom they have not heard? And how will they hear without a preacher? How will they preach unless they are sent, just as it is written how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news of good things. However, they did not all heed the good news. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report. So then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. As you think about this process, it is impossible for people to call on. That's in the response of baptism. It is impossible for them to do that if they don't believe. It is impossible for them to believe if they do not hear, and they will not hear unless the gospel is taught to them. You know, we've said a lot about influence and about our examples and about the the influence that we have on people, and all of those things are good. But just realize, as I've said before, no one is saved by a good example. No one is. They're only saved by the teaching of the gospel. And God is sending out people like you and me, and we're blessed for it, to go and to teach the word and to build up faith. Let me give you one example that helps to illustrate this concept. Turn over to the book of Philemon. In the book of Philemon. One of the smaller books in our New Testament 
But this gives us an illustration of exactly what we're talking about, how God is working through people in different means to bring about what he wants. And in Philemon, you remember that he is writing, this is Paul writing to Onesimus. And Paul has been in prison. Now, Paul converted Philemon in the past. This is someone that he had come in contact with, taught the gospel to. And he had a servant or a slave named Onesimus. Well, Onesimus actually did the wrong thing. He committed sin. He left his master. Well, while Paul was in prison, again, of all circumstances, you know, how are you going to run into this? Well, a runaway slave runs into the apostle Paul while he's in prison, and he teaches him the gospel. Well, Onesimus obeys it. Well, here in Philemon chapter 1, look at what Paul says, though. He says, For perhaps he was for this reason separated from you for a while, so that you would have him back forever. No longer as a slave, but more than a slave, a beloved brother, especially to me, but how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. What we see is God is working in the soil. He's working with Onesimus, even using bad choices of his. He's working with the sower. He's working with Paul to go through and set up an opportunity in some of the most unlikely circumstances. God has this amazing ability of providence. But turn over there to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3. The thing you'll notice, and the reason we started there in 1 Corinthians 3, is because you have these men like Paul and Apollos that are going through and they're teaching the word. But look who is the one doing the action. As you'll notice in verse 4, who is giving the opportunities? Isn't it the Lord? The Lord is giving opportunities. In verse 6, who is causing the growth? Verse 7, who is causing the growth? Is it not the Lord? The Lord is the one at work, and these men are just servants in his fields. So with all that being said, as we prepare to plant the seed, we have to realize this. So we are partners with God. This isn't my work. It isn't your work. It's the Lord's work, and we are sharing in it. You'll notice in verse 9, he says, We are God's fellow workers. You are God's field, God's building. We are working with him in that mission. We are not alone, and that's the thing that I appreciate Danny with this song today. He sang at least a couple of songs about anywhere with Jesus. Jesus is right there. It's his mission. I can go if he's going, right? That's the thing. God is using us to come about and to to fulfill his work. All right, that's providence. That means God is at work in the world that we see today. He is working behind the scenes. But let's also talk about preparation. Because as we mentioned there in chapter 3 and in verse 5, is that the Lord gave the opportunities there in 1 Corinthians. And the Bible teaches that God is the one that opens doors. It's not man. It's not through all of our work and effort that all this happens. The Lord is putting people in different places. In 1 Corinthians 16 and verse 9, Paul said a wide door for effective work had been opened to him. So the implication is, is that if God... If we want to be used by God, and He's going to give us the opportunities, as we're talking about providence, we need to be prepared to take those opportunities. Turn to 2 Timothy chapter 2. He will open doors, but He's not going to open doors just for anybody. He's only going to open it for people that are prepared and ready at that moment. In 2 Timothy 2 and in verse 21, He says, therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from these things, he will be a vessel for honor, sanctified, useful to the master, prepared for every good work. He's talking here about them changing the type of vessel they are, but he's laying out, hey, I've I've obeyed the gospel, I know the truth, now I am sanctified, I'm in a right relationship, so then I am able to go and teach the gospel. Think about this. Why would God bring sinners to people who don't know the gospel? I mean, it doesn't make any sense. Those people aren't going to teach them. But think if God would bring sinners to people that are Christians, but they're not ready. That's not going to make any sense either, right? Because you have people that, even though they may be Christians, they can't teach them. And God works through teaching. 
So it doesn't make any sense. He's not going to give opportunities to people that aren't ready. So with that being said, we need to be prepared in two senses. As individuals, you and I, in our personal responsibilities, but also as congregations. So let's talk some about individuals. Individuals need to be prepared to teach, or at least in some way, guide them to the gospel. So the question I want to ask you is, what level of preparation are you at? If we had a conversation in the back, we're sitting back there and we're discussing, hey, okay, I can do this, or I can do this, where do you fit? On this, on this system. Here's some possibilities. Think about this. Perhaps you are at the level of avoidance. You just never share the gospel. You've never done it. I've never, I don't, maybe, <laughs> maybe at this point, uh, you've never done it. You never share it. It's just something that's not a part of what you do. You just avoid it. Maybe uh, you get opportunities and you actually pass those up because you don't have an interest in doing it. Or perhaps you're more at this level where you're just reluctant, where maybe on occasion you'll do it. Maybe if they bring it up, you'll go through and you'll talk to them. They ask, you know, where do you go to services or something like that. Okay, then I'll talk to them. Or maybe you're backed into a corner, you're there with your coworkers, they're talking about the Bible, and then they ask you and say, hey, what do you think about that passage? Well, then, okay, yeah, then I'll talk about it. Or maybe you're further along and maybe you're equipped where you feel pushed or nervous. Maybe the, uh, the lesson today makes you think about more of that. Well, okay, maybe the preacher's just pushing me. Well, I'm not trying to do that. I want you to understand where you're at. But maybe you feel pushed or you feel nervous, like it's something that you're, uh, you're being uh, pushed into. And really, perhaps you're just fearful of teaching others. What are they going to do? They're going to ask me a question I don't know. I really don't. I'm not comfortable doing this. Maybe that's where you're at. Or perhaps you're competent. That's where you're comfortable and you're prepared. You know, hey, if someone talks to me about this, okay, I may not have the answer, but here's what I'm going to do. I know if I sit down and talk with them, these are the things I want to talk to them about and, and those type things. But the problem is your motivation. It's not, hey, I get to share the gospel. It's, you know, the Lord expects me to, and I'm kind of under the screws a little bit in that way. You're pressured into and you're motivated by guilt. Or maybe you're at the level of commitment, where it's anyone, anytime, anywhere. You encourage others and you're motivated by joy. You try to get other people involved in the process and you're going through and doing it. Well, you know, while these things you go through and you look and you say, well, okay, maybe I've got a little bit of this one and a little bit of that one, we're always trying to improve. You remember the, uh, the thing that people say, you can only start where you are? That's really the truth. You can only start where you are in this process. But the thing is, the Lord is wanting us to mature and to improve and to take our, our skills to the next level. Remember, the Lord is expecting growth, and not everyone's at the same level. And really, we know from James 3 and verse 1 that really not everyone is supposed to be in a teaching role. You know, that's something we need to really consider. But there are times where there are people, like in Hebrews chapter 5, where they were supposed to be teaching by that point. So we all have a part to play as individuals, whether it's in a specific public teaching role or or organized role, or if it's in some other means. But we all have a part in this system. Turn over to Ephesians chapter 4. In Ephesians chapter 4. In Ephesians 4 here in verse 16, Paul said, From whom the whole body, being fitted and held together by what every joint supplies, according to the proper working of each individual part, causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. You know, my job and the teachers here, our shepherds, our job is to help equip and to then go and to work alongside, but to where everybody is involved. And the truth is, many times, if, the, if it's just the leadership working, church isn't going to grow properly. Everybody has to be doing something in this process. Well, let's talk some, as we've discussed individuals, let's go back and let's talk some about congregations. Because congregations also have to prepare themselves for new converts. There's a way that we act 
collectively. And with that being said, uh, obviously, I talk about Jude all the time, probably too much. You know, someone's going to get me and say, hey, you're talking about your son too much. But, you know, whenever we were preparing for Jude, you know, we had made that decision that we were going to have a child you know, months beforehand. And we had already planned all those things out. And, you know, with that system, we had set money aside. We had budgeted for the cost. We had prepared. We had spent months just trying to think about having a child. And then I remember, man, she probably doesn't like me telling the story, but, man, it was all the time. We were at the house. I was coming in, and uh, all the time my wife was on the computer. Just looking up things, looking up articles, looking up different stuff for the baby. All I mean, just I'm talking lots and lots of time. And it was what she was always looking at. And then, you know, we had uh, showers, which, you know, the, the church here obviously did a really good thing for us in that way. Really thankful for that. And uh, all of that's to help us prepare. I mean, months and months of preparation. And then, even with all this preparation, months, time, money, all that stuff, it was still really hard. I mean, the parents in the audience, you know about that. Uh, it was still really hard. We still had a lot to learn. We still have tons to learn, so I don't claim to be like I already know. But we had to learn and adapt. Truth is, there's a reason why God uses the picture of children whenever he talks about new converts. And many times, when you think about churches, they go through and they just want to kind of, it's almost like they want to adopt a child. You know, okay, well, okay, I... We want a child, and then we run up to the adoption center, and we don't have any preparation. (laughs) And then they come in, and then it's just haphazard running around. And churches have to be prepared. But just like having a normal child, it's the same way for churches. It takes time, effort, and preparation. And really, just like having a child, it can be big-time highs, but also big-time lows. But the truth is, God doesn't really give us an option to say, well, okay, you can either have new converts or not. He says you're supposed to be going through and doing that process. It requires organization and planning and foresight. And I will tell you, you go through and you look at what allows new converts to stick, it goes back to two things. It is education about what the truth is. But a lot of times, you may educate them about the truth, and that doesn't even really stick. But it is also making them feel like a part of the group. You do two of those things, you do those two things well, then you will be doing well. Maybe it's having a class, having Bibles for them, being organized or whatever it is, having some planned process where it's not just throwing things together because it doesn't look good and it doesn't really bring about the process in a good way. But also about making them feel like a part of the group. You have to have some type of organization with proactive people that say, Hey, you're new here. I don't know you. Come get to know me. (laughs) Some type of system within that. We have to be feeling like a family. And just like a family, whenever a new child comes in, man, they are always on top of them. It needs to be that way with the new converts that we have here. They know what they need, and they know what to perform. Well, that being said, as I look out at the audience and I think about the church here, we have a whole bunch of people that have a ton of this experience. I look out and I see tons of parents. I see tons of grandparents. I even know great-grandparents that are in the audience that are on the third round. And they know everything about raising children. And there's a reason God associates these things together, because you have a unique skill set that you learned as a parent that is useful in the congregation. They know what they need, and all of us have a part to play. Just think about, instead of just being a a product or a consumer, where you just take in the benefits that the church does, think about being a producer, and then say, hey, I can offer my skills as a parent to these new Christians that come in. It's important. And the truth is, many congregations do not find open doors because they're just like those parents that aren't prepared. As you think about churches... They need to be prepared for babes in Christ. So do we expect the Lord to open doors for a congregation that's not ready? We've got the problem. It's not God's problem. Now, with all that being said, we've talked about providence. We've talked about preparation. You know, Paul and and all those events were brought about. They were ready to be able to teach that gospel. They were prepared to do it. But as you also think back there in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, You consider the things that are taught about 
And we see the emphasis throughout that chapter that is on God and about His work and about what the Lord is doing. We need to realize as well the importance of prayer. Because prayer really shows that God hears and God helps. In 1 John chapter 5, verses 14 and 15, he talks about praying according to the will of God. And if it's according to His will, it will happen. Now, we often use that to go through and talk about maybe someone that is sick in the hospital or anything along that line. And there is senses where God may be using those people. But remember, what is God's will primarily? God's will is the salvation of mankind. That's what He's concerned about. And when we think about prayer, it is God's people talking to God about His work. Think about the example of Cornelius. How much prayer was happening there? What was Cornelius? Cornelius was a devout man who was praying. What was Peter doing whenever they came? He was in a trance because he had been praying. As you go through and think about prayer, it is all over the New Testament, as we've talked about in the past. But turn over to Colossians chapter 4. In Colossians chapter 4, Paul was not ashamed, he was not embarrassed, to ask the brethren to specifically pray for him and for the gospel. You can see it in 1 Thessalonians, but you can also see it here in Colossians chapter 4. In Colossians 4 here in verse 2, he says, Devote yourselves to prayer, keeping alert in it with an attitude of thanksgiving, praying at the same time for us as well. That what? God will open a door, open up to us a door for the word, that we may speak forth the mystery of Christ, for which I have also been imprisoned, that I may make it clear in the way I ought to speak. Isn't that the same things we were talking about? We want to know that God is at work. We want to be prepared. That's what Paul's talking about. Give me opportunities. He was wanting to be ready. There in verse 4, he said that I may make it clear in the way I ought to speak. And where does he talk about them doing? Prayer. Pray. Pray. And many times we don't do that. Sometimes much of the preparation for evangelism, it focuses on methods and what you're going to do in order to bring about that study or what you're going to do within it. But I'll tell you what happens most of the time is we don't think about prayer. We don't start with a prayer whenever we study. We don't pray about it. Turn over to James chapter 4. In James chapter 4. I'll tell you one reason that, that perhaps when we're thinking about opportunities and why we don't have as many as we want to, think about what he says here in James chapter 4. There's some reasons that they weren't getting their desires. Obviously they had the wrong type of desires here in this text. But here in verse 2, he says, You lust and you do not have, and do not have. So you commit murder. You are envious and cannot obtain. So you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. Many times we don't have opportunities is because none of us are praying or we're not praying like we should about getting opportunities. We're not talking to God about it. But also think about this in verse 3. He says, you ask and you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives so that you may spend it on your pleasures. You know, maybe we're praying for the wrong motives. You know, I know what we mean whenever we say these types of things. We say, man, I wish the building was full. Or man, I wish we had more young people. Or man, I wish we had a bigger church or better singing. I know all of those things are are good in and of themselves. But the problem is, I believe we're asking amiss. Because you know what's missing in all of that? A concern for the lost. A concern for God's will. Because we're praying about our own desires, of what we want, instead of, God, can you please help save this person from their sins? We're asking for our own desires and not that the will of God be performed. And then we are surprised that he doesn't answer? <laughs> we shouldn't be, because we're not asking according to his will there in First John chapter 5. Turn over to James chapter 1 as well. There used to be times where we used to have prayer services. In fact, from what I understand, that's what Wednesday used to be. 
Wednesday was set up where that was prayer service. That's what Wednesday was. You know, why don't we do that for the church? Why don't we go through and think about times where we specifically pray for the church, for evangelism, for the purpose of saving souls? You know, does it come back to the fact that maybe we don't have much confidence in prayer? Talked last month about praying all the time like Jesus. Remember, we've got to have faith in order for that to happen. In James 1 here in verse 6, he says, But he must ask in faith, without any doubting. For the one who doubts is like the surf of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. For that man ought not to expect that he will receive anything from the Lord, being a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. Paul's going, or God says that he's going to give things to people that ask sincerely, that expect it to happen. And it's in God's word, so we should expect it to happen, right? Considering his word has never failed. But sometimes we fail in our prayers because we become doubting. God says he's going to help us in evangelism if we pray about it. That's enough, right? <laughs> that should be the end of the discussion, so we need to do it. So with all that being said... We see the importance here of providence, how God is at work. He's setting up the opportunities. He's the one that's causing the growth. We see in preparation how the Lord gives the opportunities. He's the one that's opening the door. And we see the importance of prayer, that God is hearing and that he is helping in that process. So the question we want to end with is this. Why should we be positive about our evangelism outlook? Remember back with Jeremiah, he was negative. He said, I just want to give up. (laughs) I don't even want to do this anymore. The fire there, uh, for him, it was within him. He couldn't stop it. But sometimes we get beat down. Let me give you three reasons. It's because we're not alone. And providence is at work. God is at work. It is because God will open doors if we're ready. Again, we have to be ready. And then also because we are praying and we're talking to God about his word. That's why we should be positive. But the question really that we have to end with is this. Have you forgotten God's role in kingdom growth? God is the beginning. He's there through the process. And he's there at the end. We are simply workers in his field. That's the point that 1 Corinthians is trying to make. Instead of being divided according to your favorite teacher, realize where they fit in the overall scheme of what God's trying to do. And have a pity and concern for the loss. That's what we need, to be concerned about God's will and hope that it is performed. With that being said, let's pray. Our most gracious and loving Heavenly Father, we come before you looking into this lesson to to look into your word and to study and to see how you are working in our lives to go and to Expand the borders of your kingdom. We ask that you use us in this service. Help us to to be lights, to influence others, to share the word with them, to encourage them, and, and to invite them. Father, we ask that you be with this church as we we look into your word and we want to strive to improve and to be the type of church that you want us to be. We ask that you help us to Be stronger, be with our elders, be with our deacons, be with each member. We can all be involved in your process, Father. Watch over us through this day. In your son's name, amen. With that being said, we want to share the gospel with you. Jesus was sent by the Father for you, for your sins. The scriptures taught about how Jesus would come and he would die for our sins. He would be buried and be raised again. In the gospel, we are taught how we connect to that powerful death. It is through the waters of baptism. You have heard the word. Do you believe it? Do you believe in who Jesus is? Perhaps you maybe need to hear more about the word. That would be fine. We'll be glad to sit down and talk with you. Are you willing to change? Because he came to save us from our sins. We can't stay in them anymore. we got to repent. Are you willing to confess the faith that you have in Christ as the Lord of all creation, as our Savior, as Christ, and then be immersed in water, connected to his death and obedient to his will to have your sins washed away? If you haven't done it, do it today. 
If you're a Christian, maybe you've walked away from the Lord. The Lord wants you to come back. He's like that father in Luke 15 who's looking out and pleading that you come back to him. If we can help you at all, come forward as we stand and sing.